Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our GEC online service this morning. You're really welcome, and thanks for joining with us. This morning, our worship will be led by Verna and Megan, and uh, our children's talk will be led by Ross, and our uh, talk will be on the Beatitudes of Jesus. We'll be looking at another one of those. Also, we're going to have a time of communion, so if you'd like to get some bread and wine ready to join with us in that, that'd be great. And then Kathy will lead us in our prayers towards the end of the service. Uh, we're also going to have a time of fellowship, a tea and coffee after the service. And that'll be in your own kitchen and you'll be making it yourself today. Hopefully, we'll all be back here together in the not too distant future and we'll be able to do it all together. Come on, Ross, come up and lead us in prayer to start the service. Thanks. Uh, good morning everybody uh, maybe you just let me lead you in prayer uh, as we kick start this morning let's pray together father as we stand outside here in the sun uh, and we hear your birds singing uh, we thank you for uh, the mercies and the good things that you have given to us um, and thank you that it's just such a reminder as well that you are still good even in tough times Father, we pray for uh, each and every household and, and person who watches the service this morning. I pray that they would be blessed by the words that come from your word. I pray that as we worship and as we sing, uh, that we would make you smile. And even in your, your grace, that you would minister to us as we do that as well. We pray you'd be with, with each of us during this next hour or so. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
managed to enjoy some of the absolutely beautiful weather that we've had. I have a suspicion that there may have been a couple of paddling pools that have made the first appearance in the summer this week. It's been really, really lovely. So I wonder what your favourite toy is. Well, I asked a few people to tell me what their favourite toy was and I got back a few answers. So Daniel, who's six, says that his favourite toy is his Optimus Prime. Grace, who's also six, she loves her Hatchimals. Dougie, who is 55 from Shank Hill, loves playing with his G.I. Joe. And Millie, who's six, says that she loves dolls for inside and she loves bikes for outside. I wonder how you would have answered that question if I'd have asked it to you. Perhaps you would have said, mm, maybe something like this. Oh, I think I need some practice. Perhaps you would have said that your favourite toy was maybe uh, a toy car. Or maybe, for some of you who are a little bit older, maybe your favourite toy was something like this. But, can I, I tell you what my favourite toy is? In fact, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you what my favourite toy was whenever I was younger. Come with me. So this is it. This as a kid was my favourite game. Some of you might not know what it is and it's a game called Subudio and it's a football game. Now I don't know if I've mentioned it before but I really like football so it's not much of a surprise that my favourite game was a football game. And what it is is you've got all these little guys and they're on these sort of little stands and what happens is that they glide across the grass when you tap them and so what you've got to do is you've got to pass the ball between your guys and yes got to try and score a goal what's really important about Subudio is that what you needed to have was obviously the pitch and obviously the players but what was really really important was that you had a nice surface to put your pitch on. In our house here, we've got a wooden floor, and so it means that the players can slide along really quite easily in order to tap the ball. But if you didn't have a good surface, you weren't really able to play. So rather than you just believe me that the surface is important, I thought I'd come outside to the grass and show you how the surface is really, really important when it comes to Subudio. So I'm out here on the grass, which is obviously more uneven than the wooden floor inside. And look, this guy can't even stand up properly. If I put some pressure on the mat, he flips back up again. And when it comes to trying to tap the ball, it becomes more difficult because look, the ball just keeps coming back in all sorts of different directions. So you can see that the surface underneath the grass mat for Subudio is really, really important. Now, over on Kids Zone on the DEC website, Ben's not going to talk to you about Subudio, although that would be pretty cool. 
well, for me it would anyway. But he's going to talk to you about this parable that Jesus taught about four different surfaces. There was a sower who cast some seed over some different surfaces, and it was the surfaces that were really important. Jesus was saying it was the surfaces that was the important thing about whether the seeds would grow. So I hope you pop over to the website, onto Kids Zone, on the DEC website, and you enjoy looking at the parable with Ben and with your family at home. Hi again. This morning uh, we're going to talk about the third of the Beatitudes that Jesus talked about on uh, the sermon that he gave on a, mount si on a mountainside in Israel some 2,000 years ago or so. As I've said previously, his thoughts and words were life-changing. They have affected the world ever since. Jesus was setting out what the kingdom of God is about. So that when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have some idea what that actually means and what we're trying to pray into being. Jesus' words were and are controversial. Many have thought them unbalanced. And while some people would suggest that they are nice words with nice thoughts, they're not very realistic. They're not true to life. We also looked at the fact up to now that some of the Beatitudes work on two levels, both physical and also parts that affect our inner soul. So when we look at the first Beatitude, those who are poor and poor in spirit, those who are physically poor, those who are broken inside, those who mourn as a physical act to express sadness at last, and also mourning as a spiritual act of recognition of our human brokenness and rebellion against God. We also noted that Jesus quotes the Old Testament scriptures all the time. And it's helpful for us to look at those scriptures to help us have context and understand what Jesus was talking about. Especially perhaps when he quotes the prophets. Though this morning uh, we're going to see that he, quote, he quoted a psalmist. Each week also I said that we would uh, read out the Beatitudes in a new translation. Or not a new translation, a different translation. And um, this is uh, possible because of the internet. I don't have that many Bibles. And so far we've had the New International Version and the Message. And this week I'm going to use the New American Standard Bible, which is one of the more literal uh, translations out there. And the reason that I'm doing this is so that we can have different angles and flavours looking at the same thing, but of course from some slightly different angles. And so here we go. This is the Beatitudes, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
I was watching a TV program recently about two violent criminals and they were really ruthless guys and they appeared to be extraordinarily successful at least in terms of the riches that they had accumulated. They'd made a lot of money from selling drugs and basically other forms of misery and they'd ploughed this money into legitimate building projects and they're standing on the top floor of a half-built office block. And one says to the other, with more than a hint of irony, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the two of them roar laughing. When you think about it, it's generally not the gentle, as the NASB translate the Greek word praus, or the meek who get their own way. They're not the ones who get to the top who succeed. Indeed, you won't find meekness and gentleness as the most sought-after attributes in salespeople or in senior management teams. In fact, it's often the brash, the brutal and the strong-worded assertive people who seem to end up at the top a lot of the time. I think we can sometimes assume, incorrectly I think, that Jesus is talking about meekness as a particular personality type, i.e. The, sh- the shy, retiring person who likes to remain in the background rather than take an upfront role, just like me, or not. So if meekness is not a personality trait, then what is it? John Stott suggests that there's not one single paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount in which a contrast between Christian and non-Christian standards is not drawn. It's the underlying and united theme of the Sermon. Everything else is a variation on it, he writes. Therefore, if you agree with Stott, and I think I do, it means that we cannot mix up or mush together the standards and ideas Jesus gives us in his talk with the views and values of the world at large and try to make them into a hybrid philosophy. They stand opposed to each other. Therefore, meekness must stand opposed to whatever is the opposite to it. So how are we to view this idea from Jesus that we should be meek and gentle? I suppose much of our thoughts will depend on our view of him. And I think that how Jesus is viewed in the world from the time he was born until now is very dependent on the zeitgeist, the thoughts of the people in the world at any particular time. The American author Church Polinick, Chuck Palahniuk, uh, in his 1999 novel Survivor, imagines a conversation between his anti-hero and someone giving him a lecture on art. In the scene, he describes how art expresses the underlying social understanding of Jesus in the 20th century. She told me about different 20th century art movements and how they depicted Jesus crucified. In the oldest wing of the mausoleum, the wing called contentment, Jesus is gaunt and romantic with a woman's huge wet eyes and long eyelashes. In the wing built in the 1930s, Jesus is a social realist with huge superhero muscles. In the 40s, in the Serenity Wing, Jesus becomes an abstract assembly of planes and cubes. The 50s, Jesus is polished fruit wood, a Danish modern skeleton. The 60s, Jesus is pegged together out of driftwood. There's no 70s wing and in the 80s wing, there's no Jesus. Just the same secular green polished marble and brass you'd find in a department store. Polanik may be a keen observer of art movements and he may even be right that art through the decades gives us an insight 
into how Jesus is perceived. Or maybe even how our understanding is bent into a mould that is more in keeping with, the, with how society wishes to view him. All the pictures are distorted in some way. But we have to understand that how we view both the person of Jesus and what he taught is constricted to at least some level by our own view of the world, wherever we are in time or the place that we happen to be in. Just as his earliest listeners had to chew on what he said and try to understand his words outside the confines of their experience and presuppositions, so do we. Therefore, I'm sure that Jesus' call to gentleness is indeed sway, swayed by how we understand his words and actions. What did he think about the world in which he lived, where Herod, the puppet king of the Romans, was a cruel dictator? All the Herods were, the father and his sons. Where Roman troops supported a regime of cruelty and disinheritance of the land that God had given to his people at the time of the Exodus. I'm sure as Jesus spoke that many of his listeners asked themselves some hard questions like how do we view this idea of gentleness and meekness as compatible with the instructions of God who uh, told his people to go in and subdue other peoples to inherit this land that they were sitting in as Jesus spoke. Surely inheriting the land was dependent on fighting for it. Possessing the earth means using power to retain it, not gentleness, not meekness. Today, every country in the world deems invasion of their land as an act of war. Land is precious to us because we believe it is ours, just as his uh, historic listeners did at the time of Jesus. I wonder what they thought. I'd love to have heard some of their discussions afterwards. What does he mean? What does this mean? Matthew tells us that there were many different types of people lis listening to Jesus during this Sermon on the Mount. There were religious Jews who knew the Torah off by heart. There were zealots who were the terrorist Jews who wanted to fight the Romans and throw them out of Israel violently and rule, of course, the land themselves. There were non-observant Jews who were branded sinners and outcasts from polite society. There were Greeks who were curious about new philosophies and who travelled around listening to anybody who would tell them anything that would just stir up uh, their, their, their intellect. And of course the Romans who possessed the land and wanted to keep it. How could the words of Jesus apply to them all at the same time if their aspirations were different? How could the words of Jesus apply to them all at the same time if their aspirations were so radically different? Indeed, how can the non-assertive, non-aggressive inherit the earth? Let's face it, when the current President of the United States speaks on the TV, I imagine most of us are pretty sure that he does not take this idea too literally or believe it to be true at all. In fairness, he's not alone. Most of the leaders of other superpowers also like to talk about their economic power, their military might and what will happen to anyone who crosses them. Meekness, gentleness does not seem to be a value that is held highly by those in power. As I said earlier, Jesus liked to quote the Old Testament, and this time is no different. Listen to these words from Psalm 37. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Ah. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The righteous shall inherit the land and live in it forever. There's little doubt that the psalmist was writing about the physical land of Israel 
and I'm sure that many of Jesus' listeners, maybe especially those who knew the scriptures well, would have thought that that's what he was talking about too. Within a year of this talk, there were many in Israel who had begun to believe that Jesus would lead them in a great revolution against the Roman Empire. They believed that his mission as Messiah was to establish a kingdom like David and Solomon had centuries before. However, he constantly quashed such thoughts, and at times he even hid from the people so that they would not try to install him as the king. Indeed, in the final week of his life, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and burst into tears. Heartbroken at what would happen to the city when it was destroyed, and probably also at the rejection of the people, rejection of God. They had refused to accept Jesus as their true Messiah. You see, they could only see power through the lens of military might. They were blinded as to what Jesus meant when he talked about his kingdom. Perhaps the inheritance of the land he was talking about was not simply property or fields or even the country itself. But the kingdom of God which infiltrates every part of life and which at the end of time will cover the whole earth. Just as Jesus refused to be the king that the people wanted to make him to be, the kingdom was also not the one that they could immediately see. Jesus defined what meekness is. When his disciples asked him, who is the greatest among them? He humiliates himself by washing their feet and demonstrates that greatness is found in serving, in meekness. During his trial and execution, though he could have made a blindingly clever defence, Jesus says virtually nothing. And when he could have called on angel armies to save him, he allowed his executioners to beat him to a pulp and nail him to a cross. Jesus makes meekness and non-violence the signs of true greatness. It is anything but weakness. Nietzsche, the famous 19th century German philosopher, opposes the vision of Jesus, calling it a slave morality, prompted by the natural resentment of the weak against the strong. He reckons by preaching humility and meekness, making oneself small, turning the other cheek, Christianity introduced, according to him, a kind of cancer into humanity that has extinguished its energy and destroyed its vitality. So his idea really is that this type of Christianity of gentleness, of turning away from anger and of uh, um, not wanting to fight and non-violence actually extinguishes energy. I want to suggest to you that he's wrong and that it creates a new vibrancy and a totally different type of vitality. Mahatma Gandhi, the Hindu non-violence nationalist leader of the Indian people, who effectively brought the great British Empire to its knees through a policy of peaceful protest, had the polar opposite view to Nishi. He said of the Sermon on the Mount, I could not care if it was proven by someone that the man called Jesus never lived, and what was narrated in the Gospels was a figment of the righteous imagination. For the Sermon on the Mount would still be true for me. That was from a Hindu. The words of Jesus had such an effect on him. He realised that strength is not defined by many others, is not as defined by many others in the world. In a security mad world, we might be tempted to think that the bigger the army, the more secure we are. However, has the last month, last couple of months, 
not taught us that this is a fallacy. The greatest and mightiest military powers in the world, the USA, China, Russia, seem to have suffered the same, if not more, than most countries. Their armies are of no use in facing down the greatest threat to their citizens at the moment. The meek, therefore, I think, are those who practice what Brian Zand calls radical trust. It's not a personality type. It's not about being extroverted or introverted. It's about understanding that security comes from God. I like what he says. The meek are the ones who believe in God and are willing to trust God for their portion and their security. The way of violence and aggression is the way of Caesar. The way of meekness and trust is the way of Christ. And they are in contradiction to one another. They cannot be meshed together. Meekness does not equal weakness. In fact, it is the opposite. It is strength derived from trusting in God for security and for an inheritance that will last forever. Let me end by using Paul's exhortation to the church in Colossae as a prayer. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, please, Lord, help us to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, meekness and patience. Amen. caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave oh, I'm not here for pleasure Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want And I'm 
sorry when I just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I just want you and nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else. No, nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else. No, nothing else. Nothing else will do. in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy We now come to a time where we break bread together, where we celebrate communion. I know for many of us, this particular part of the service has taken on a special significance during the lockdown period. We find it difficult not to be together with each other, yet we know that we remain together by the power of the Holy Spirit in unity and love. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be caught up in your presence. We want to pause and sit at your feet for a moment or two. We pray for this holy moment together as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. That sacrifice which opened up the way to the Father and to a common faith which joins us together as one family. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We do this in remembrance of him. Maybe you could join with me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body.
Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us and grant us peace, we pray. Christ be with you, Christ within you, Christ behind you, Christ before you, Christ beside you, Christ to win you, Christ to comfort and restore you, Christ beneath you, Christ above you, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love you. Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Amen. Good morning and welcome once again to our Sunday service here at Dunleary Evangelical Church. It is a beautiful day as I'm recording this and a beautiful week as we are in the first week of our COVID reopening plan here in Ireland. Yay! We have been given freedom, well, a little bit of freedom, from the tyranny of the COVID-19 virus. So, I hope you don't mind if I steer this week's prayers towards thanking our Father God for getting us this far. I know some of you might not be feeling quite so chipper at the moment. Perhaps you're suffering with the virus yourself or getting through the very long recovery from it. Maybe you've got underlying health problems that mean you're feeling scared and vulnerable. Or maybe you've lost someone you love because of the virus. Our hearts and prayers go out to you, they really do. And we ask Father God to be the strength that you need now and for the Holy Spirit to hold you up when you feel like you can't take any more. We've moved into our new normal. We are outdoors more now than we were and we can go further than we did. But the world is weirdly different. We have to queue all the time, so many queues. And we have to stay apart in order to keep each other safe when we really want to hug each other. We wear masks, gloves and keep trying to imagine just how far two metres really is. But we are still here and we still have each other. We can see friends even if it's only in the garden or on a Zoom call. Fellowship hasn't disappeared, it's stronger than ever. We've been through change and perhaps come out all the better for it. And for that we thank you Father. Thank you for making us resilient, loving people in your image. We certainly do church differently now. Hmm. We've got different kinds of fellow attendees. It's a bit more relaxed, perhaps. Please ignore the washing and drying on my radiators. I'm just keeping it real here, folks. And the tea and coffee gets served during the service rather than at the end. The food being served is a bit below Hillary's usual standards. Yes, Casey was eating a pot noodle for her breakfast. And I have failed as a parent. But we are still being spiritually fed. We're still joining in with service, with worshipping our great God, and we still pray together. And that's what we're doing right now. So, thank you again, God, that you give us DEC people who are willing and able to continue doing church in whatever way they can and wherever they can. We thank you for the people joining us from across the world, wherever they are when they watch this. We never were just a building or a group of people. We are your church, and nothing can stop that. As we were out on our first freedom walk this week here in Honey Park, we came across some words that had been chalked on the pavement. They were certainly put there to encourage someone, or maybe to encourage everyone, so we wanted to share them with you. Father God, please make your power known in the countries that are being ravaged by the virus at the moment, and particularly in those countries where their authorities are being very heavy-handed. We prayed earlier this week at our Wednesday prayer meeting for South Africa in particular, so we bring that country to you today. Please also help Ireland's leaders to guide us through the, to keep us all safe as we lift the restrictions. And I'll end where I should have started. Father, you are a good, good God. There is no other God like you and you are our God. A few weeks ago, Mervyn, hi Mervyn, 
heard from a lady who now lives in Sydney, Australia. Hi, Sheila. Uh, Mervyn last saw Sheila in 1962 at his wedding, and Sheila has been watching our services. Sheila said, We're entering an oh-so-different world. Everything has changed suddenly, but I'm not at least worried. I've been kept and brought through so much that this is a piece of cake to my God. You go, Sheila, because you're absolutely right. So we bring all of these thanks and requests to you, Father. We ask you to bless us and keep us for the week ahead, and we're looking forward to your face shining on us. We ask all of this in the name of your dear son, Jesus. Amen. So before we sing our closing song, let me remind you of our online Zoom Bible study, which is starting tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock and our Zoom prayer meeting at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. If you don't have an email invitation, please contact Cathy. Her details will come up in a minute or you can get them on the website. The Elisha series dailies will now be on Wednesdays and Fridays. I can't do one for Mondays, obviously, if I'm doing the Bible study. Then please click, click on Dougie's dailies on the website for them. So that's it. So let's sing, Megs. of
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore amen thanks for joining with us today we hope that you've had a wonderful time and that you'll join us again next week